Uh, in next uh, 45 minutes, and I hope that um, uh, uh, Ray will remind me how much time I have um, for that. So uh, I'll be talking about the HVC system. I have a, a good uh, colleague of mine working for our sister um, uh, service, Air Force, and uh, we have, uh, we're agreeing with him on uh, many things, but one, uh, about um, uh, how we're getting uh, buildings uh, ventilated. Uh, he keeps telling me that buildings need to breathe, buildings need to, to not to be airtight so that you can have uh, some air and you have uh, enough air to have uh, indoor quality to certain levels. And uh, I, I came from the culture where you have a kind of control of uh, what uh, you're doing. So uh, uh, I prefer to use other system to bring a fresh air because when you bring air from uh, the building, uh, through the building fabric, you are getting untreated air, unfiltered air, and you damage the building fabric. And actually, you are not using uh, waste heat or uh, waste cooling energy from your uh, return air. So actually, the best way is to use what we call HVAC systems. And I'm pretty sure they already convinced that you really need to have um, good HVAC systems to uh, have a uh, high performance building and uh, to uh, uh, have the system properly designed. So you already heard quite a bit from Joe and from Ray on uh, basic principles of HVAC systems. So I would like to emphasize some type of systems that you might want to consider for this or that type of buildings and uh, basic technologies that you uh, need to, to use um, uh, uh, in these uh, systems. So we all agree that HVC system uh, is used to um, control indoor quality, to provide thermal comfort, to pressurize uh, the building. And also um, uh, one important part that can justify additional expense on the building is to, to um, uh, improve your productivity. So actually um, uh, uh, labor costs much more than energy and you can uh, justify using certain type of systems to increase your productivity so that uh, in summer, for example, you um, don't have uh, water breaks for 15 minutes or 30 minutes or 45 minutes because you are losing more by um, uh, uh, letting people uh, taking these uh, breaks. So um, I would recommend to go to um, ASHRAE stand 189. This is um, uh, the best stand that we have in this country. Uh, for um, uh, requirements to efficiency of HVAC systems. So for residential buildings, you want to go to um, uh, the energy star requirements uh, for um, uh, um, different components. But 189 has uh, the best requirements for efficiency of your systems. One other thing that uh, you want to remember that your systems have um, uh, all these chillers, boilers, uh, air handling units, it has uh, terminal units, it has ducts and pipes. It's very important to have uh, the ducts well sealed and insulated and to have um, the pipes well insulated. So uh, uh, I think that you already heard from Ray that uh, you uh, don't want to have cool surfaces, especially in the areas which are not ventilated. So if you want to have an airtight building, you have to keep your chases airtight, and that's where you have your pipes and ducts. And you want to have um, uh, good insulated pipes and ducts there. So all um, uh, uh, cold surfaces, cold water, chilled water, um, uh, refrigerant, uh, all of these pipes need to be insulated. And uh, this is the reference uh, to um, the HR standard 90.1-2010 or um, advanced design guides, or um, uh, uh, UFGS on level of uh, sealing of um, the ducts and level of installations. In the climate zones one, two, and three, you need to maintain a certain uh, temperature on the surface above the dew point so that you don't have a condensation. I visited a few um, uh, uh, newly built buildings in Korea and uh, you can uh, exercise your martial art on the walls. You just uh, need to have a finger and you punch it through um, the wall because they're so fluffy. Uh, they have unsolated pipes in the chases 
and um, uh, walls get wet and it damages the fabric. Forget about mold. Uh, you, uh, there's not much uh, left uh, from the wall and um, uh, uh, that's a pretty expensive fix. So um, uh, this is what uh, you wanted to um, uh, remember about pipes. Now let's talk about um, uh, different systems. We'll have uh, mechanical systems, natural and hybrid systems. So you can have um, uh, natural uh, supply, mechanical exhaust, you can have uh, mechanical uh, supply, natural exhaust. So, um, uh, you can have uh, different ways. So in most cases, we're currently using uh, all air systems, which provide ventilation, make up uh, building pressurization, heat, uh, cooling, and humidity control. And I think that uh, you're already uh, convinced by Ray that you want to separate these uh, systems uh, by the function. You want to have one system that does ventilation, provide enough indoor quality. Uh, you want to have uh, the system controlling humidity, providing pressure management, and then another system that uh, does uh, heating and cooling. Because if you um, uh, will use uh, the system together and have only one thermostat that controls the system, you may get your know, mold problems. So this is a kind of a schematic of the dedicated outdoor system. And as you see, you have one system that treats the outdoor air system and provides ventilation. There is a complementary system that uh, provides heating and cooling. So now about choice. When we're talking about uh, our um, buildings, we want them to be well insulated, we want uh, them to be airtight, and we want to have a good lighting system which uh, provides right lighting levels, and then uh, talk about uh, different luminaries that uh, are energy efficient. So all this can be accomplished through these first stages. Now you're getting into um, uh, HVAC systems. As you can see, there's not much uh, difference b uh, between energy used by this system because the load is uh, reduced, and I'll show you in a couple of slides uh, how it is reduced by this type of buildings. One thing that I would like to pay your attention to is that um, uh, we are used to, to uh, look at the site energy, and on the site uh, energy uh, uh, level, we are talking about different systems with the different COPs, and we are uh, trying to get uh, this uh, ground couple heat pumps in uh, most of our buildings. So now we need to, to make sure that uh, on the site energy, it's energy conservation. You can uh, save a lot of energy, but it uses electricity. And because of the efficient use of uh, production of electricity, the fossil fuel um, uh, uh, consumption goes up. So it's good for site energy, it's not good for source energy in some climates. So uh, this is a table that shows in different types of buildings uh, cooling and heating energy um, uh, use by the building built to meet EPAC 2005, which is 30% um, uh, better than uh, uh, Azure Stand 90.1 2004, and the high performance building. And as you can see, compared to that already uh, uh, good uh, and efficient building, you can save 50% of energy. You are reducing your heating and cooling load by almost uh, uh, 50%. So now we're talking about much smaller systems compared to um, already efficient um, buildings that we're using for the baseline. So we can use maybe different systems. Low, and I will use uh, this term, exergy system. It's uh, almost like energy, it's small delta T. You can use um, uh, waste energy for heating and cooling. So, um, uh, you can use other type of systems, and you can use smaller systems, and that's how you um, uh, pay um, uh, for uh, increased insulation and increased air tightness and other uh, windows by smaller systems, smaller boilers, smaller chillers, smaller ducts, uh, smaller in insulation on these ducts and uh, pipes, and other things. So in, the, you, in your life cycle cost, uh, you are adding the cost of insulation, and you're subtracting the cost of mechanical systems and energy generation systems. And by the way, also the cost of PV and other renewable sources that you want to put to meet ESA requirements and others. So let's uh, walk through uh, some technologies which are typical for most of uh, the buildings. 
it's energy uh, heat recovery for heating and cooling. And uh, so uh, the graph on the, uh, down shows the simulation results showing how you can, uh, how much energy you can save from the overall building uh, energy use using heat recovery. It's, uh, it doesn't do you much good in uh, Miami, but it's uh, increasingly in, uh, uh, better in colder climates. Uh, Ray already mentioned about condenser heat recovery. So in order to uh, uh, reduce your humidity in uh, the uh, dedicated outdoor system, you need to <coughs> cool uh, the air. But if you only cool the air and you don't reheat, you're getting very uncomfortable jet going uh, somewhere to your neck and uh, you feel uncomfortable. And um, besides, it creates a cold surfaces and uh, which uh, the temperature of those are below uh, dew point, and that's where you have condensation. And that's where you'll have a uh, mold growth. So you want to reheat it, but reheat requires um, some uh, uh, energy. So one way is to utilize the condenser heat um, uh, to reheat. And uh, some companies uh, using uh, standard um, elements to um, move uh, your condenser into the duct and providing a reheat for no additional energy use. You don't need to use all of this. You can use some of uh, this heat to preheat and make up water, for example. So this is a kind of a schematic where you're using traditional um, the heating and cooling coil, and then you have um, the deep cooling to um, take the moisture out, and then you have a um, reheat with a condenser um, uh, uh, coil. Another technology that you want to consider is um, evaporative cooling. And there's a misconception uh, about um, uh, where you uh, can uh, use that. Uh, I have a question for you. What will be uh, the temperature in the, uh, let's say, in the brigade headquarters um, uh, in New York in the summer? What's the design temperature relative to humidity? Probably around 72, and relative humidity about 50. How about if you go down to Miami, what will be the temperature there? Same thing, right? You go to Alaska, what will be the temperature there? Same. So actually, the room temperature and the relative humidity is almost the same in all climatic zones. So then when you take this air uh, as a, in a return duct, the parameters will be almost the same everywhere in the world. So the psychrometric chart will work uh, the same way everywhere. So you can uh, uh, cool this air taken from the room using um, uh, uh, evaporative cooling. And then you uh, use this cooling or heating energy uh, to the outside air through the heat recovery. So you use this um, uh, heat recovery device in the dry mode in the winter for the heat recovery of heating or preheating your um, uh, outdoor system. You are um, uh, spraying the water there or using other technology to um, uh, bring some water and do evaporative cooling and then bring this air through the same heat exchanger in the wet mode. And that's how you can uh, use uh, this um, uh, technology to pre-cool, not uh, to cool. In some uh, climate zones, you can uh, uh, do cooling uh, with this technology in dry climates, for example. In some uh, cases, you can pre-cool so you have uh, less load on the uh, cooling coil, right? So uh, you have uh, different types of technologies that you can use. You can use um, uh, 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 traditional uh, uh, spray chambers, or you can use uh, some uh, mats, or you can use other technologies there's a good technology from uh, Colorado where they have uh, advanced surface and it allows you for deeper cooling and you don't get um, moisture into um, uh, the air. You don't have uh, droplets into the air, so you use um, uh, wisely your water to do um, uh, pre-cooling. And uh, you are getting pretty uh, deep cooling in many climates. So now you can see the um, blue bars show that uh, how much energy you can save even in um, uh, uh, humid climates, 
But then if you um, uh, combine this with a um, uh, dry uh, heat exchange during the winter time, that's the um, uh, red bar. And you can uh, use up to 16% um, uh, uh, of uh, energy or, uh, saving, or uh, let's say 10 in many other climates by using this technology. And uh, actually, it's not, uh, it's not maintenance free, but uh, uh, actually, if you use the right technology like um, uh, this uh, Colorado, uh, it has a pretty um, low maintenance cost. So now talking about uh, air um, uh, system versus hydronic systems. This is what I was talking about. Um, uh, uh, when you have cold surfaces, you have a mold growth, and you have um, uh, wallpaper peeling along the jet. So you can, uh, by those patterns, you can uh, uh, learn how the jet is distributed in the room. There is a different uh, technology, and some uh, uh, there are different types of radiant systems. You can put uh, radiators near the wall. You can uh, have uh, this uh, um, heat exchange surfaces embedded into the ceiling. You can put it in the concrete. This is one of the technologies that you can use, both for um, the heating and cooling. Actually, um, uh, what's the advantage of this uh, technology? First of all, it doesn't have any moving parts. Uh, uh, maintenance free. Secondly, it uses less energy because the fan power uh, is uh, greater than the pump power. Okay? And uh, you don't need uh, to change filters on the fan cold units. So uh, you can have it uh, in the false ceilings, or you can uh, uh, put it against uh, the ceiling, you can staple it, and then uh, uh, you can uh, put some plaster on top of that. And for those who are um, uh, afraid that there will be some problems uh, with the uh, leakage, this is the uh, uh, plastic welded um, uh, mat. If you have uh, any problem, for example, a uh, soldier wants to put his favorite uh, picture on the ceiling. <laughs> and here, uh, put a nail through um, uh, this capillary system, and it'll be a droplet. You just need a small uh, piece of plaster to take out, and you use your lighter to seal that. It's like when you um, uh, have a problem of, uh, you cut your finger, you just uh, cut uh, some of your uh, capillaries, and uh, uh, the hand heals, right? Same thing with, with that. It just takes a lighter to um, seal uh, this mat. There's enough surface uh, to um, uh, deal with that. So this example, how you put uh, this mats on top of the false ceiling. And uh, this is a kind of a uh, building station that is used um, uh, to um, uh, provide cold water to um, uh, different areas. It uses a heat exchanger, which is a pretty small one, a pump, manometer, thermometer, and expansion tank. And actually, this is the size of systems that we want to see also for heating systems, by the way. Uh, in uh, the buildings with the district uh, uh, systems, uh, this is the size and arrangement of the system for heating. So you have two systems, one for cooling and one for heating. So uh, for those who want to uh, uh, look at examples in the United States, because most of the examples are um, uh, hundreds of uh, systems uh, built in uh, Europe since maybe 20 plus uh, uh, years ago, uh, you can go to see the library in the culture architecture. That's a kind of a national historic landmark, and uh, they tried the system uh, there. So it works above the books there. And uh, I haven't heard about any damage to books uh, yet during the last uh, three years. Uh, they have uh, a couple of systems installed uh, since uh, then, uh, one in Atlanta in the humid climate in office buildings. So um, I would encourage you to try that and see if uh, you are comfortable uh, with um, that. Uh, so this uh, kind of uh, arrangement of this uh, system above uh, books and uh, uh, above uh, those clouds um, and the ceiling. So. 
When you're talking about a regular building with a regular um, uh, uh, building envelope, a regular level of insulation, uh, probably uh, that, uh, this uh, maximum heating and cooling loads might be of interest to you. But now we're talking about um, uh, high performance buildings with a heavy insulation and airtight. In this case, you don't need uh, these loads. You are well below uh, the maximum loads that um, uh, are allowed by this system, both for heating and cooling. So um, you want to distribute pieces of this system evenly uh, across uh, the ceiling. So because you really don't have a lot of uh, heating and cooling load throughout the year. And uh, talking about the price, this is a kind of a um, uh, ballpark. You pay about uh, six bucks per square foot. Uh, it's not the whole ceiling. Again, it's only part because you're reducing uh, the size of this uh, system. It's about additional eight bucks per square foot uh, for the installation. Now, uh, ground couple heat pumps. It's a different technology. As you can see that on the side, we have a, a great um, uh, savings, 50-60%. Uh, However, you need to uh, look at the balance of the building, heating and cooling. It works uh, very well along uh, I-70, where you have uh, heating and cooling. As you go south, uh, you don't have enough um, heating capacity, so you overwhelm your ground. If you go north, um, again, you don't have this balance. You're not um, providing enough heat into uh, the ground. So uh, uh, as a result, uh, one of uh, our um, uh, examples where um, the Army installed uh, most of the ground couple heat pumps is Fort Polk. You can see air conditions after a few years of um, uh, utilization of this uh, system because there's not uh, enough cooling capacity in the ground. The ground is overwhelmed. So now let's uh, uh, give a kind of a short list of technologies that you want to use in different types of buildings. So for barracks, you use dedicated outdoor air systems for ventilation, pressurization, and makeup air. Condenser heat recovery for DOS, energy recovery ventilators, radiant heating and cooling, and uh, all uh, variable high efficiency pumps, fans, uh, separate ventilation for living area and laundry uh, area. Uh, this is a short list. You, you can go on beyond uh, that and uh, look at something else. This is something that you might want to consider. This is a kind of um, uh, uh, combination of uh, different technologies that can be used uh, in a certain synergetic way. So you use your heating uh, uh, from the uh, uh, hot water storage. This is stratified uh, storage where you are uh, bringing your gray water heat from showers, you're bringing your um, uh, solar water in the middle of the tank, and you're bringing uh, uh, your um, uh, high temperature heat from the boiler at the top. So that's your um, uh, thermal storage stratifier, so you can use uh, different uh, uh, temperature and, uh, heat at different levels. Then uh, you have uh, your um, cooling coil, and uh, you use it for the decayed outdoor system. At the same time, you're using the uh, return water for the radiant cooling. You don't need a high uh, uh, delta T on the systems. The um, supply temperature is about 62 degrees. The return temperature is about 65 degrees. So actually you can use the uh, cascade uh, cooling energy from one system to another. And uh, by doing that, you're not only saving uh, energy, you're also improving your COP on the chiller. <coughs> And then if you choose uh, to use uh, uh, humidity control uh, using a DX system, you have a um, uh, heat uh, recovery from a condenser heat. So these are kind of um, uh, ideas what you can uh, do to um, uh, uh, optimize the overall system performance in the barracks. So let's look at the brigade and botanic headquarters. The AV system with the uh, reheat and outdoor economizer Dedicated outdoor system with um, uh, heat recovery and direct evaporative cooling, and radiant heating and cooling. The AV systems with um, uh, energy heat recovery and indirect evaporative cooling for pre-cooling, and of course, high efficiency pumps and fans. Maintenance facilities. Vehicle exhaust uh, capture. You want to uh, use the right system 
because typically if you go to um, uh, a maintenance facility, you see um, uh, uh, hose reels everywhere because it's must to have. But uh, most of these uh, hose reels cannot be attached to army vehicles because of the nozzle size and capacity and types of um, uh, hoses that are used there because they're not temperature resistant, so they are melted. So uh, first of all, um, when you are ventilating the temp facility, uh, most of the fumes are coming from the running vehicle when you're bringing the vehicle in and out. And uh, actually, when you're bringing the vehicle in, you're not attaching it to the hose reel, right? So it's just hanging because uh, it has to be there. So if you use a, a rail system, you can bring the vehicle in uh, attached with the minimum uh, emissions. Or you can use uh, this um, uh, uh, bar to um, bring it in and out. And the payback on the retrofitting is uh, two, three years to do this type of system. Because you are reducing the size of your ventilation system. You are reducing your dilution uh, need for the contaminants. And you are if you go to um, most of the fire stations in this country, you can see the systems there. And the reason is that uh, firefighters have to live there. And they understand that uh, they will get cancer in a matter of um, uh, years because of the diesel fumes. We are dealing with the same type of uh, fumes in our facilities. And uh, actually, um, uh, even if um, uh, the engine is not running, the clothes absorb all these fumes and they are uh, off gas uh, later on. So it's the secondary source of uh, diesel fumes, which are cancerogenic. It's not only a, a matter of uh, energy conservation, it's a matter of um, uh, health and safety. So examples of those uh, rail systems and different nozzles that uh, you can use uh, uh, for the systems. You can't use this small um, uh, four or six inch hose and attach it uh, to um, uh, the tank. Another technology you want to consider in uh, maintenance facilities. You want to pressurize the office space. And we talked already about the air tightness. We're not talking about uh, 0.25 in the whole maintenance facility. We're talking about uh, 0.25 CFM per square foot in the office space. Because uh, from the repair bay, all the uncaptured uh, fumes go to the office space. So you want to pressurize and cascade uh, this air from uh, office to the Bay Area. One technology that uh, uh, Army was the first to use on the maintenance facility is the solar walls. For uh, probably 10 years, it was uh, one of the retrofit technologies that Army used. I never seen uh, this being designed before, maybe a few years ago, by Port Carson, who first uh, uh, introduced it in 1996, I believe. And now they uh, designed the first uh, maintenance facility in 2006 to use that. So it has a good payback on the retrofit, but it has a much better um, uh, payback when you uh, design uh, the system. And it can be used, well, actually, the uh, best spectrum of this uh, technology at Fort Drum. If it is, can, uh, can be used at Fort Drum, it can be used in uh, all states. Uh, if you go to a maintenance facility, in 99% of cases you will see uh, air heaters. Actually, it's uh, the best um, uh, snow melting device you can imagine. What happens? The warm air goes up, it hits the roof, it melts um, the snow. Uh, and uh, people at the bottom are cold. And besides, they have uh, to go under the vehicle and lay on their back. And so it's uh, very uncomfortable because um, uh, the floor is cold. So what you want uh, to see is uh, uh, the system that creates no stratification because typically they're not uh, working uh, near the crane area. They're working uh, near or under the vehicle. So uh, this is the system for new construction. If you want to retrofit, probably you uh, don't want to use a uh, radiant uh, floor system. You want to have uh, this um, hydronic or um, uh, uh, gas-fired 
overhead. But um, uh, actually, uh, the way to put uh, them, the only place is uh, near the wall. And if you are lying under the vehicle, uh, they do uh, no uh, heating for you. So um, uh, actually, it's a partial measure. If you can uh, do it uh, uh, from the beginning in a new construction, that's the way to go. And if you want to see um, some examples for Carson, for drum, they do have uh, this in hangars and uh, maintenance facilities. Another technology for you to consider is uh, vestibule, especially in uh, Alaska in cold climates. And you can use um, the space for the vestibule uh, to um, uh, preheat or precool the vehicle before you bring it into the space. Again, uh, the payback is very reasonable and you can utilize the space, not for storage, but to preheat into a pre-cooled vehicle. Uh, there's a variety of um, the technologies that are available for uh, dining facilities. Dining facilities are one of the most energy consuming uh, uh, facility because of the processes. 50% of energy on the building goes into the process. So first of all, you look at the kitchen exhaust and you optimize the kitchen exhaust. You eliminate single island hoods, so you don't put um, the hood uh, in the middle of the kitchen, so the air goes uh, from four different sides. Because the main idea behind the hood is um, to maintain the capture velocity. The capture velocity will be higher if the flow is restricted, right? So the more restricted flow is, um, less air you need to maintain the capture velocity for contaminants. Does that make sense? So you want to have one-sided uh, hood or a two-sided, and you I want to put it uh, as close to the wall as possible to restrict the airflow. And then uh, you use advanced uh, HVAC systems, and what you do is uh, you uh, use the air twice. You don't um, uh, supply ventilation air and um, uh, uh, a dilution uh, air into the dining facility and exhaust from there, and then make up air into the uh, kitchen area. You can use ventilation air from the dining facility and move it all the way to the kitchen. You cascade the air. Make sense? And in this way, you prevent all the odors from the kitchen into the dining facility, and you use this air twice as the uh, dilution and as a makeup air for the hoods. So uh, this is an example of the wall-mounted uh, canopy hood, and uh, you add uh, some side panels, and you improve the performance by 30%. It's not only the amount of air you extract, it's the amount of makeup air which you heat and cool, right? Another thing that um, uh, uh, you prevent the gaps between uh, your equipment and the wall, because the air will go through this gap, and you have to uh, provide a makeup air for that and exhaust. Oops. So this is how this small thing called a gap affects um, uh, the performance of the hood. Also. Uh, Based on your menu, you have a different operation hours of a different type of equipment. So you don't want to run your exhaust hoods all the time. You want to have a demand control hoods and you want to have a demand control uh, makeup air systems. Well, what you can do is uh, you can consider variable speed drives for kitchen exhaust and makeup air uh, fans and have a sensor that shows whether you have fumes coming from uh, uh, the stove or uh, you don't. So uh, you have optical uh, sensors, you have temperature sensors, you have different type of uh, sensors. Heat recovery. You have a lot of um, uh, heat, and th this is an example from uh, uh, West Point. That's the, the biggest restaurant in the world. It, it's a fast food uh, restaurant uh, feeding uh, 4,500 uh, cadets in half an hour. 
Uh, well, uh, you, you can uh, look at uh, our website where we analyzed about um, uh, uh, 400 different um, uh, technologies um, and uh, 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 you can uh, choose from those uh, other than I haven't uh, listed and it, uh, uh, based on the different types of buildings and uh, different uh, categories of um, uh, technologies and there are some uh, uh, energy conservation measure uh, fact sheets that describes the technology, describes uh, the application and shows uh, the energy saving and payback for different climate zones both in the United States and uh, 15 climate zones in uh, Europe. And uh, you can also look at uh, the case studies uh, that uh, we um, um, put together for uh, building retrofits using this type of technologies. Any questions? Okay, we'll have um, a question and answer session uh, after that at the end, so uh, think th through that. This gives you a kind of an um, uh, overview of uh, what's available what uh, can be uh, recommended based on the, some uh, studies and the common sense. And um, uh, uh, of course, as I mentioned, as you take care of the building envelope and you um, reduce the load, you reduce uh, the um, uh, air that is coming through the cracks, there's not much left for the mechanical systems. Thank you.